Well, I'd like to welcome you to our program this evening. My name is Courtney Campbell, and I'm the I'm their Chair in Religion and Culture here at Oregon State University. And this is our concluding event of our fall lecture series, um, uh, sponsored by the Hendera Endowment, as well as the Ideas Matter program in the philosophy, School of History, Philosophy, and Religion. Um, and our focus this entire term has been on uh, healings and hurtings, religion, the body, and the self. And we thought it'd be a very excellent uh, opportunity to have our program closed down by some local physicians. Uh, some of them I've had a chance to work with um, over the years in various capacities, and a couple of others I've just met for the first time uh, this evening. Um, but we're really delighted to be able to put this uh, program on this evening. I'm going to uh, make just a brief introduction of of each of our panelists this evening, and then our format is going to be there's some questions that uh, I've uh, presented um, to the to the panelists um, for them to reflect on over uh, however long it's been, and uh, they'll will sort of work through some of those questions. And in the course of that, we hope that this will be really a fluid conversation. Um, not, uh, it's not intended to be a presentation by any particular speaker or a presentation by all, but hopefully a fluid community conversation. Um, uh, before I begin, I just wanted to acknowledge a couple people that have uh, been here. Uh, there's a, uh, no, we don't have too many more seats. There's a couple more seats up front if uh, folks were interested. Um, uh, I wanted to acknowledge um, uh, Bob Pecknow, who's our public information representative in the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion, and uh, has been here at every program to videotape. He also was responsible for taking care of the logistics for on many matters, and most of these are available. The lectures are available on our website and YouTube channel. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. So um, if you want to look at past, um, uh, past, uh, so, Past, the past sessions that we've had, uh, you can go there, or this evening's what will be an astounding presentation, I'm sure, that uh, we get high notes and ratings and all that. Um, also wanted to uh, acknowledge one of the uh, inspirations for setting up this panel comes from, uh, for all of you students in the audience, uh, please take this to, to heart, um, this, one of the inspirations for this panel was an honors college thesis that um, I had the privilege of chairing uh, this, last, uh, this last spring term um, uh, by Tiffany Soto. And Tiffany's, you want to raise what? Uh, Tiffany's there at, there at the back. Um, and she had an opportunity to interview some of the physicians on, on, the, on the panel as part of her thesis work. And, uh, Perhaps more importantly, she's uh, been admitted to medical school, and is, uh, which is, I think, a really great opportunity and, and very deserving for her. So, um, and there are other folks that we'd like to uh, thank that are here uh, this evening. Nina Carson from our school has been taking photography every every program, and unfortunately, she's not able to make it here tonight. It looks like, um, but with that. Uh, let me just introduce, uh, briefly introduce our panelists. Um, immediately to my left, or let's see, that's, that's the right hand. And he is on the left, and there's no question. Uh, this is, uh, that's going to give you a hard time. This is uh, Dr. Dave Crew. Um, he graduated from the University of Oregon Medical School, which is now OHSU. Um, uh, and he did an internship in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, he spent 35 years at Paloma Family Medicine. I uh, was, I believe, the founder of Paloma Family Medicine. Um, he retired in 2012, um, but he continues in, to serve as a community in various capacities. Um, he's uh, currently the regional medical director for Compassion and Choices of Oregon. Uh, he is on occasion the interim medical director for the Oregon Medical Board, and he's uh, also a member of the First Presbyterian Church in, um, uh, in Corvallis. And I have to say that David has been a very strong advocate of uh, some of the things that I've been trying to do on campus over many years. He was one of the first individuals that came as a guest speaker to my 
courses in death and dying and medical ethics, and I've appreciated our conversations over um, as many, what's going into their third decade now. Um, to, uh, to David's uh, left is Dr. Charlie Clark, um, and Dr. Clark uh, uh, trained and graduated at the Wayne State School of Medicine in, in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, and she worked as a general practitioner in Eugene for three years and completed an internal medicine residency in Arizona. Um, she's worked in several realms of healthcare. Uh, I don't didn't list them all here, but uh, she's worked in emergency room settings for Indian Health Services, Planned Parenthood, Student Health Services, uh, international. She's been an international medical volunteer. Uh, she was a founding hospitalist at Good Samaritan Regional Medical Center, the medical director of Benton and Lynn County Community Health Centers, and currently she's a assistant professor of internal medicine at Western University, the new osteopathic school of medicine in Lebanon, and also academic hospitalist at Good Samaritan Regional <coughs> Medical Center. Um, to uh, Dr. Clark's left is uh, Sean Foley. Um, Sean, uh, I know Sean fairly well from our hospice, uh, common hospice experiences on uh, board of directors and, and uh, the ethics committee. He comes from a family of physicians. Uh, his father practiced um, uh, 53 years, uh, most of them as a family doctor in, in uh, uh, South Dakota. Uh, he also has two siblings who are physicians. Uh, uh, sister is a pediatric intensivist in Arizona, and a brother that practices as a family doctor and sport in, also in sports medicine in South Dakota. Uh, Dr. Foley graduated from the University of South Dakota School of Medicine um, and did his residency in family medicine in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, he practiced in the emergency room while his spouse, uh, Janet Lawrence, um, who's on call tonight, I, I guess, uh, for, for Sean, uh, completed her residency um, in internal medicine, and she is currently an in, in internist at Corvallis Clinic. Sean has been, uh, or Dr. Foley, I should say, has been a uh, physician at Floma Family Medicine uh, for the last 16 years. Um, and as I indicated, he and I have had a lot of conversations uh, through our hospice connections. He's the medical director of the Benton Hospice uh, Service, and was, uh, I think, really significantly named the Hospice Medical Director of the Year in the state of Oregon for this, uh, for this current year. Um, he's on what's called the Hospice Dream Team. Um, and then, uh, uh, last but not least, by any means, uh, Dr. Lori Herndon uh, graduated from the uh, Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, uh, completed an internship at East Moreland Hospital in Portland, Oregon. Um, and did a family medic medical residency at Valley Medical Center in Renton, Washington, and uh, has also worked in the Public Health Rural Medical uh, Service and the Salute Medical Center in Woodburn, Oregon, and enjoys the small town atmosphere and the opportunity for community uh, involvement uh, that Floma uh, provides. So those are our, our panelists for this evening. And, uh, what we'd like to do for uh, our format is just each each of the panelists have just asked them to give a couple of just a couple of minutes to start with regarding um, uh, how issues of uh, healings, hurtings, and spirituality comes up in their various uh, ha may have arisen or may come up in their various practice, and uh, then after they just briefly introduce themselves to you via their vignettes and, and the like, then we'll have some uh, questions that I'll pose to the panelists. And again, as I said, hopefully that point will become much more of a fluid conversation um, with you as well as others uh, engaging our panelists in, in the discussion. So, Dr. Drew, would you start us off? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the induction. I'm glad that you're all here. And I hope you can all hear me. I'll speak as loud as I think is necessary. Um, so I practiced, I had two practices in the almost 40 years that I practiced family medicine. Both were in small towns. And when you practice in a small town, um, you're known in the office, but you're also known out of the office. And, uh, have, and being a church attendee most of those years, um, many people knew uh, that. And 
So one of the vignettes that I would like to share is that um, oftentimes as a physician, your, uh, your experience in a community uh, go beyond the walls of the clinic. And um, I enjoy music, and my wife and I are singers. And so um, early on, I've been asked to participate in um, religious services, both Christmas services or Easter services, and singing at funerals. And uh, so that was an experience that I never anticipated when I went to medical school, that I would end up uh, performing um, in religious uh, events uh, the rest of my career. Uh, I'll have many other things to say, but I'll limit that to two minutes. Um, so, uh, I think uh, my vignette will be more related to my first exposure to um, spirituality and cultural practices because I think spirituality and cultural practices and religion kind of intersect pretty significantly. And uh, I was um, a general practitioner down in Eugene uh, when a lot of the Laotian boat people had um, been um, initially brought um, and, and, um, and found safe places to live in the Eugene area. And because I worked at a community health and education center that was sliding fee scale, that's where they would come for health care. And when there was difficulties with their health, um, we were who saw them. And it was the first exposure I ever had to something like cupping, which is where they take very, um, they take cups and they heat them up and they have uh, put them across the back and so I would be this is 30 more than 30 years ago but you know you lift up someone's shirt to listen to their lungs and you have these rings all across their back that look like they're almost a burn um, and that was you know through translation trying to sort out what had happened to um, the person I'm seeing who has you know probably pneumonia or, or any other who knows what it is um, at that time the thing that was most striking is um, they were trying to take care of it a different way by sucking the bad spirits out or and, and trying to understand and try to be culturally appropriate and find a way to um, allow uh, both Western medicine and Eastern medicine intersect in a way that was um, respectful of the beliefs but making sure that what was happening wasn't in, in our way of thinking harmful. And so um, that was the beginning of um, my understanding that you really have to honor the culture, the spiritual, religious backgrounds of your patients uh, to really allow them to heal fully. And uh, so it's, it's difficult a lot of times to figure out what is going to be safe and what isn't going to be safe and to fully understand that people have to feel they can trust you and share the whatever practices are that are happening but that's always been um, a very important part of my practice so that's my story um, I think I'll just talk a little bit uh, I guess my story I was going to just talk about more personal things with my hospice hat I actually still am the medical director and some of the stories I guess I worry that <laughs> I don't know if I really want to go into too much detail. I don't know if I can do that. Um, I'm just going to talk about my family just a little bit, uh, let you know where I come from. Um, probably the biggest event that probably shaped my life was uh, my sister's, who Courtney mentioned, she's a pediatric intensivist in, in Phoenix, a wonderful person, one of my favorite people. She and I kind of grew up in the end, we're uh, the youngest of seven children. When my sister was in seventh grade and I was in fourth grade, um, we got in a fight and she had a lump on her knee. and. Um, uh, you know, kids fight, she's one of my favorite people, but I said, I wish you'd get cancer or die. And when I was in fourth grade, that uh, haunted me. The next week she had a biopsy and it turned out she had a really severe cancer. Uh, she had a, a sarcoma. It didn't look like she was going to live. And uh, I lived with that for about five years. I, uh, I prayed every day. I actually became very religious. My family was uh, Catholic. and. Um, I prayed at my every wish I had, every first bird of <laughs> first robin of spring, and she survived. She made her five year mark and things went on. When I got in high school I started thinking a lot about, you know, my experience and um, I sort of um, I, I became an agnostic after that. I actually uh, said I, I, I came to the conclusion that I couldn't live with the guilt of uh, me causing my sister's illness. And uh, I kinda had to forgive myself. And uh, I said, Well, you know, if there's a God out there 
uh, he, that would be a pretty cruel trick to play on a 10-year-old <laughs> year old boy. My sister came out of that experience, interestingly. She's a physician, and she actually uh, has become pretty religious. She's actually uh, very Catholic. I, and to me, I re totally respect. She's still one of my favorite people. We talk all the time. She's one of my best friends. And it's interesting. I, I'm just going to relate a couple of quick things. You know, um, I found an organization in hospice that respects everyone's view. And around this community, I, have, I found a place where I could practice. I think everyone respects each other's uh, spiritual views. And it comes up a lot in my job, actually, about people questioning, you know, um, why did this happen to me? I deal with a lot of end-of-life issues. And those questions are difficult for me to answer. I really appreciate the support that our, our, our staff gives each other in those, in those tough questions that I think are kind of unanswerable. But uh, uh, I just like to that's kind of a vignette I guess I would share. Well, my vignette also is informed by my own um, religious belief. I'm a member of the Baha'i community here in the area. And a lot of how I see my relationship with, with patients and how we navigate these questions around spirituality and religion and belief. Um, it's kind of embodied in this statement, but I'll, I'll just read to you. The primary task of the soul will always be to investigate reality, to live in accordance with the truths of which it becomes persuaded, and to accord full respect to the efforts of others to do the same. So it's this mutual respect that helps navigate this situation. So I want to share a, a story from a, a few years ago where this came into play. And it's a story that really, um, there's an element of how spirituality or praying with patients might um, enter the picture, um, but also about how a physician's own moral framework might lead to certain decisions and choices in its relationship with professional ethics. So this was about six or seven years ago, a patient of mine was <coughs> diagnosed with a terminal cancer. And um, she was someone who sought both conventional medical treatment as well as alternative medical treatment. I have many patients like that in my practice, and it's just fine. Um, she also followed a spiritual path, which was very personal. It wasn't grounded in any formal religious faith. Um, but I, but we were, I was aware that that was important to her. And as she neared the end of her life, she asked if I would aid her in dying. Um, now, as a Baha'i, my practice, my, my, my faith, informs all the kinds of decisions that I make. It, my, um, it infuses, you know, every day of my life, um, the development of my own character, all these life choices, and this moral framework and personal ethics and how I view my professional ethics. Um, and so this area, physician aid in dying, is something which my faith doesn't offer any specific directive. So what I needed to do was really reflect on the principles as I understood them, that my faith informed me of, and think about it, and then speak to her again. And so after study and prayerful meditation, I concluded that I couldn't be the person to write that prescription for her. As you may be aware, um, the law uh, allows that someone who is terminally ill within six months of, of death and who is of sound mind and able to make these decisions for themselves can approach a physician um, to write a prescription that they can then take at a time of their choosing to end their life. Um, the law also requires that two physicians attest to these facts, that they are terminally ill and that they're able to make this decision. Um, and my faith also places high virtue on truthfulness. Truthfulness is the foundation of all human virtues. So I felt that I could, while I couldn't write the prescription, I could truthfully attest that she was terminally ill and that she was uh, a sound mind to make this decision. And so when I next met with her, I explained this to her. Um, and because we, we really did have a, a relationship of mutual respect, she accepted that immediately. And I, she understood my position. Um, and I arranged for her to meet with another physician so that she could carry out this act. Now, um, we stayed in communication through the course of her illness. And um, she let me know the week that she planned to take her prescription. And I asked if I could visit her in her home, um, which I did. Um, 
she she knew that I was a Baha'i, and so and because you know we knew that we each shared a, a spiritual practice, um, I knew it was okay if I could ask her to pray with me, and then I would pray with her. So I sung her a uh, Baha'i prayer, and she was very moved. She asked if the pray if she could have the prayer so that it could be read at her funeral, which it was. So that's my thing. Thank you all for, for that. Uh, those uh, were very moving, moving stories. Uh, and it's very much appreciated on our part to make yourself vulnerable to us in the way that sometimes we feel before our own physicians. Um, uh, one question that we wanted to start off with, uh, uh, given that the title of our program this, this year, our lecture series, has been on healings and, and hurtings, was to ask about the concept of of a healer. Um, Sir William Osler, who was a very foundational uh, formative physician for uh, contemporary medical practice, um, as well as uh, many of the current medical codes, the Physician's Charter for Medical Professionalism in the 21st century, um, explained that the role of a physician is to be a healer. Um, and that's sometimes different than what we might think a physician's responsibility is. So, just like to ask any of the panel to think about uh, or reflect on is, is a physician, in what ways is a physician a healer? Um, in what ways do those, uh, term, those terms sort of coalesce or overlap? And in what ways might they, might they be different? Well, whoever wants to take that on, go ahead. Well, um, I have. Uh I think that that's a, one good term for a physician is a healer. Um, a, a, another term for physician is doctor, which means teacher. And I think that's equally as important and valid. Uh, I think we are trained uh, in medical school and then through our experience that those are both very, very powerful roles and important roles to be a teacher and a healer. Um, and so I think that that's an obligation and a duty that physicians should have. Um, we now, though, live in an age where, uh, I guess it's always been true, but it's ever more true that we can't always heal. Um, we have gotten to the point, and I'm sure many of you have read, if you've not, you should read this book by Atul Gawande called Being Mortal, which is the number one bestseller now, about the fact that we can't heal everybody. Um, we may want to be healers, and the default in medicine is to do everything, but really, um, there, we're getting to the situation in end-of-life care uh, where we can't be healers. So if we can't be a healer, what, what should we be doing? Uh, and the way that I uh, believe personally is that we then need to focus not on curing, but on caring. And care should be um, the, the main focus that we have. Um, and that the enemy is not to die, that the, our patient will die, but the enemy is that they would suffer. And so our, our whole, in my opinion, uh, work then becomes on doing things that would decrease suffering. So that's different than healing, but it is part of healing because uh, if you can take care of a person's suffering and manage it and, and be, be with them, um, that's a type of healing also. And uh, so I will, I will take issue with the word healer because that, um, implies that the person outside of the patient is responsible for the healing. Um, but I, I totally agree with Dr. Um, Groove on everything he just said, except for the part about the healing, and that I think we probably would agree on that after we had this slight conversation, because the person who's <laughs> going to do the healing is the person themselves. And that's why people who um, are sick or ill or um, have psychological um, beliefs that they're going to die, like in voodoo practices, where people believe they're going to die because something happened, and so they do. Um, that the, the person who's responsible for the healing is the patient themselves. And I think when the physician um, believes in the patient and cares for the patient and stands with the patient during whatever is going on um, and says, I'm here for you, I will be with you, I will... Um, assist you in whatever way is necessary so that your body can heal, so that you can be healthy. Um, that's part of what our role is. 
Um, and so both educator and um, advocate for the person that's there and caring is a big piece of this. Um, but we, we are not healers. We don't do something from the outside that magically makes people better. We have science and training that helps us know when antibiotics are going to be helpful and we can offer them, but some people will get better with the antibiotics and without them. You know, there are studies that show that people are going to get better anyway. So it's not always what we do. Um, people actually survive appendicitis without having their appendix taken out. That everything we do is not always um, what results in people getting better. But we can offer what we have learned might be effective. Um, and we um, hope for, um, uh, we hope that we can be of assistance to the people with our caring and with our knowledge, but we're, I, we're not healers in the magical sense of healing. The person's body has to do that. Um, yeah, I think there's lots of different terms that could be used. I think that's, uh, that's true. I, um, I, I think some physicians will view themselves, interestingly, as technicians. Uh, there was another talk I heard <laughs> uh, not too long ago that uh, if a physician, uh, some physicians really feel like they just want to get as technically proficient as they, as they can be. And, and, and I think sometimes that leads some physicians to not really um, take a personal relationship with the, with the patient. I think it's a criticism of medicine, and I think it's, it's true. I, you know, I, I was privileged to work with Dr. Groove for many years, and Dr. Hendon, and, uh, this community has a lot of good physicians that really uh, put their heart into their patients. So there, there is something to that, that a patient really wants to feel connection rather than just a, a technical procedure. I mean, I think patients want technical competence, but I think they also, there, there's something about going through this journey together. And uh, American medicine could try to, Say no, no, no. We just want to. We just want to be technicians. But that's not. If you look at any other society, there's always been a healer, a physician. You know, you look at the Native American cultures, and there's shaman. You know, you look at. Uh, I've heard about some interesting uh, Australian uh, faith healers who go in people's dreams. I don't know how that works. I don't know if there's anything to it, but it's it's interesting. I, I think the Chinese have uh, their physicians are supposed to be role models in their community about how to live. And as much as physicians say, no, no, I just want to be the best technical technical person, I don't think our society's really going to allow physicians to, to do that, nor should they. And I, again, my hospice hat sort of uh, makes me appreciate how much patients and everyone really wants that connection and needs it. And, you know, when we're done with this world, we're all a narrative. That's, that's all we are. And we're this connection to the story. People fight so hard to keep their story, and they want to tell someone. They want to. They want to leave a legacy on it, and to go through that journey with them is very special. So, like I said, I've been very privileged to be able to do that through hospice. But uh, uh, yeah, healer. I guess it's a healer. I, I like how you say relieving suffering. I'm not sure there's a great term. I, I, I guess I call myself a physician, and I'm not exactly sure what that term means. But uh, it's something. <laughs> I wasn't really sure how to respond to this question, and I really appreciate what you all have, have shared too. So maybe just, I'm just gonna offer a, a few maybe very incomplete thoughts about this. Um, I also went immediately to this idea of healer and educator. I think <coughs> that those who educate and those who are involved with healing are really um, uh, part of what their work is, is to make sure that there's an environment in which these things can happen. So with education, it's an environment in which inherent capacity can um, manifest itself. And in healing, um, it's you support an environment in which the body's own ability to heal can take place. That's what you said, Charlie. And um, so, um, uh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, oh, well, um, I mean, we are, we are integrated beings. We have biological processes that require certain conditions to heal, but we also have a social environment. Um, we have a spiritual environment as well. And I, I guess, like you said, Sean, I mean, the best physician is one 
who can be attentive to all of that, to be cognizant of, about all of that, to be able to foster a conversation with the patient that addresses all of that in, in those critical moments. It's not going to be the conversation you have if somebody comes in for a cold, for instance. But in your work, in hospice, I mean, that's where it really comes down to. People are there at the end of life, and they're, they're thinking more deeply about their whole life experience. They may be suffering in many different ways. They may be suffering not only physically, and hospice does such a good job of alleviating that suffering, but they're also suffering perhaps as they think back about the course of their life and their choices and their relationships. And um, again, hospice does a good job at at, at least uh, providing an environment and tools and people who can address that. So I think the best position is one who can be attentive to all those things and see people as an integrated whole rather than just a set of, of um, test results or, or just biology. I'm just going to jump back to respond to that. I appreciate that and I appreciate how you <laughs> practice. Well, you know, for hospice, I have a big advantage because I get to practice <coughs> with uh, an enormous team. We have a spiritual care uh, uh, person. We have uh, social services. We have an aide who takes care of personal care needs, and all that you know, they get so much uh, uh, connection to that to that uh, patient, and really help them sometimes work through some incredibly difficult things. Sometimes we don't have an opportunity to do that, but yeah, those are some of the most distressing cases are when people have called uh, existential angst, is what we call it. It's uh, you know, I I will try sometimes, and I prescribe some incredibly high amount of medication to try to calm some people's symptoms, some levels of medications I never thought I would be really prescribing, and it still doesn't help some people. It's, it's, it's truly incredible. And so that, that really is some of the deepest, uh, deepest parts, of, parts of people. Is there any, uh, anybody from the audience who wants to raise some questions or engage with the panelists about this notion of physician as healer or as body as healer, physician as technician, or as a person that is there to take the journey along the, along the way with the, with the uh, patient? Any, any questions you'd like to ask? Yeah, so getting to kind of what you were just talking about, when you have this situation of existential suffering or, you know, whatever sort of term you use, and you can't approach it, or if, uh, the medical treatment, you know, in terms of a prescription drug isn't really helping that, even when you get to these crazy high doses, what do you do? Um, how do you care for that? How do you alleviate that suffering? You know, I think the best is to, you know, just be with the patient. Um, you know, we, we, do tr we do try to figure out what's, what really people are concerned about. Um, what, is their, what is their, you know, basic need that they're... Herb, would you mind if I share, you want to share your father's story? No, please go ahead. Yeah. I, I, we, I'm sorry, very much, but we no, cared for fine. we cared for uh, Dave's father, and I, I I don't know if I can tell the story as please. well as you, but no, uh, it was very touching, and I appreciated you sharing that with with our staff. Um, I think your mother uh, was in the depression. Is that she? Yes. Uh, so she um, they had a shortage of food, and uh, I think his role was always to make sure that, or he always wanted to make sure she had enough food. And he was having a hard time at the end. And uh, we had a volunteer who, uh, uh, he was very, even though she had passed on, his father was very concerned that he wasn't providing food for her. So we had a volunteer that actually said, I'm feeding, I'm feeding uh, <laughs> your wife. And uh, it really kind of relieved his suffering. So we looked for things like that that, you know, that can kind of help. I mean, most of the time I'm able to sort of come up with alternative medicines to, to do it. Sometimes we've actually had to have people go back to the hospital for um, even more intensive uh, medications, and um, so I appreciate you guys taking care of them at that time too. But, uh, well, there are the many modalities. We don't always have to go to the medical modality, and music is uh, another modality. And there are music therapists uh, who are wonderful at relieving anxiety at times uh, in these situations, um, and and. Many other kinds of, you have to kind of think in different ways. Hypnotism is sometimes effective. Um, and, and then, but I, I think as Dr. Foley said, you, a good idea is to always speak to the patient and ask them, you know, if you had a perfect day, 
what would you think would be a perfect day? And if they could describe that for you, then can you construct things that would allow them to get to that somewhere near that day? Uh, that's kind of a one mantra in palliative care medicine. Anyone, anyone else that would like to raise questions? Yes, go okay. ahead. So would you say that everyone who heals is a physician? If, a, if every physician is someone who heals in some way? Uh, people who do musical therapy, are they physicians? Well, it could be. Musical therapist is, a, is, a, is an <coughs> occupation that's a, like a physical therapist or a, a occupational therapist, speech therapist, there's a musical therapist. Well, yes, every one of those individuals is a healer or uh, allows the body to figure out ways to heal. Um, uh, those people um, uh, are all part of, of a, a team that can, in, in different arenas, be effective. And chaplains also, uh, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> yeah, we've had some really, I've learned so much uh, we had one gentleman who was uh, very concerned because one uh, he was part of a faith community that believed that they were going to be go separately in heaven. I guess once he died, his wife was going to still be here, and he had a lot of angst because he didn't know. According to some Bible verses, I'm not sure which ones, but according to the interpretation that he was given, they would not be together in heaven. And they've been together 60 years. It was very troubling. And I, I'm actually not sure how our chaplain has, uh, but it's, uh, we've actually gotten some relief. And I, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure. They come with these profound questions. I would have to say, you know, I, one of the most interesting things was we actually got a criticism in hospice. One time, I, we don't get a lot, but we get some criticism. I was, read those very thoroughly try to figure out how we could do better. And one criticism that we got was actually one person's <coughs> spouse criticized us for treating her husband's suffering too much. She felt that he actually should suffer more at the end of his life because that would uh, make make him pay for some of the things he did. Or I wasn't exactly sure how to take that. <laughs> but it really was the only one we've had that say we, we, we treated someone suffering too much. I thought that was very interesting. Maybe another kind of therapist was needed. Yeah. <laughs> Tim, and then maybe we'll move on to another question. Healing and curing. In what ways are they similar? In what ways are they different? Well, as Dave said, I, you know, we, we can't cure everything. And, uh, um, uh, you know, healing gets people to a state where they can function and be okay with, be okay with the world, I think. And, uh, some thoughts? Let's, let's move on to an, another question. This is a scenario that for many physicians is uh, very troubling where they would draw boundaries, boundaries of professionalism, um, the medical literature and ethics literature that I'm most familiar with, again, suggests a panoply of opinions on this. So the assumption here is that suppose in the course of the visit or prior to a procedure, uh, your patient uh, asks you to pray with, with, uh, with them and their family or to read some passage from a scriptural text, uh, say the Psalms or the Bhagavad Gita, uh, would you participate in whatever ritual uh, the patient and the family requests? And in general, what would you what would you say to the patient? So uh, maybe we'll go, if you don't mind, uh, we'll go this go way this, this way, time. Sure. So, <laughs> Maura, would you mind starting with that? Not at all. Well, I mean, in my in my vignette, I already shared that um, that that did happen and that has happened. You know, it's not a request that I get very much. And I think back in the 25 years I've been practicing medicine, a specific request like that has only come my way a few times. Um, but it's something that I would readily respond to. It would be hard for me to imagine a situation where I wouldn't honor that request because what it says to me is that this person has enough trust in me to ask me to share in a deeply personal and important moment, which is about their own spiritual healing and physical healing. Um, so 
you know, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of um, uh, experts who say you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. And um, I mean, lawyers will, will tell you not to, you know, talk to your patients at the grocery store, <laughs> things like that. That are just they're just not reasonable in terms of human relationships. Um, and so I would rather take the risk to be a human being in that room at that moment than try to abide by some kind of ethical standard, which really doesn't make any sense to me. So, and I haven't gotten any trouble yet, as far as I know, so I'll just <laughs> keep going. I, I've, I've been asked to, for a patient to pray with them a couple times, and you know, as you know, I said, you know, my, I'm an agnostic, I don't know, and so I, I say I don't know a lot, but I, I, I've been a silent witness for some prayers, and I've uh, just been with patients, and I don't, I don't feel that that's um, violating a code or a trust or anything, um, I, and people ask me, and I say, I, you know, I think everyone prays in their own way, and I sort of pray in my own way. Um, I think, I think we all, I think, I think all of us probably have a different view of uh, uh, of what prayer is, and you know, um, some would pray to win a sports game, or some would say that's not good, or some would pray for other good things. But uh, um, you know, I think prayer can do a lot of different things. So I. Um, I'm certainly fine to be there in a, in a, you know, as a silent witness or um, I put my hands on patients too. I found when I've had to pronounce patients, um, I do find myself touching, touching them, and I just feel like I need to make that connection. I guess, you know, people ask me what, you know, I've had patients ask me what my, uh, if I have, you know, do I have a faith community or, or not, and uh, it depends on how they want it. It depends on why they're asking it or how they want to ask it, but I, I do have my own sort of belief. I think there is sort of some sort of common humanity or some sort of. I think there's a lot that we don't we don't know. I mean, I would say um, it's been fascinating at the end of life to find out how many pe how many people towards the end of their life actually do see relatives in the room that they haven't seen for a while, and I, I think they seem to be seeing things that we're not seeing, and I. I don't know what that says about our world, or I think there's way more to this world than what we understand, and I'm perfectly willing to accept that and be with people however they want to make sense of the world, because I think it's a strange place, so. Um, I find that if a patient is asking me about my religious beliefs, uh, that they're, they're, it's a, actually an opening to a conversation that they want to have about theirs. And so I usually turn it towards them and allow them to tell me what their needs are and what their beliefs are. And I um, feel that um, I am there to assist them. Um, my beliefs don't have anything to do with what's going on. And so I um, have been a silent witness. I have sat in circles with families, held hands with families, um, and seen many people um, die. Um, or get better, and um, I don't, I think it's a part of our, um, I think it is professional to participate in that at the request of the family, but I don't actively pray, I don't tell them my religious beliefs or lack of religious beliefs, and I don't think that that um, is part of my role, but I do think supporting their beliefs um, and uh, what feels right for them, as long as it's not going to be harmful to them, is um, part of what is um, my oath as a physician. Well, I agree with each of what the others have said. Um, this is context contextual, isn't it? Really, we're putting it in the context of each individual patient at that moment in the room with the doctor, um, and if they're asking a question. And so that, the answer is different every single time because those moments are different every single time. And that's one of the wonders and honors of practicing medicine is that each person's story is different, the context of their story is different, and your relationship with them. So um, I agree, I think it's really important uh, if we are being professional to remember that um, the, uh, it's what the patient's needs are that matter not what my needs are. So if they are asking me to pray with them, then I need to be thinking, why, why, why is that? I, I may or may not 
Um, I have and I have not. Uh, but what I really wanted to figure out was where they were and what were their needs because um, it shouldn't be about what I wanted for them or what my faith uh, system was. Thank you. Members of the audience that may want to engage on this particular question about uh, physician participation in various rituals, yes? So something a bit different. So I had a surgical procedure a number of years ago, and the surgeon prior to the procedure asked if he could say a prayer. Mm -hmm. And I accepted and found it to be delightful. But it was very shocking, actually. <laughs> Well, um, I'm glad that it was delightful for you. That bothers me a bit. That uh, that he, or if it had been a woman, or she, um, uh, offered that to you in a way because um, maybe you, he knew or you didn't know if if that was going to be acceptable to you. He said, "May I?" So that's good. But there, um, this is a something I'm very sensitive to. A surgeon who is about to do a procedure on you has incredible power, unbelievable power. You are sort of there like, okay, please do a good job, but there's not much more I can do except go to sleep, and then you're going to do it. <laughs> um, and so that is not a, that's not a balanced relationship. The, the person with all the power then saying, well, golly, uh, may I pray for you? What can you do? You say, no, thank you. And then you're worried that he's going to be mad at you as he goes in. <laughs> um, it bothers me a bit. Uh, I, can't, I won't rise to say that he was unprofessional, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a bit bothersome to me. So I, I'd certainly agree with that. I mean, I think that um, it should always be the patient who initiates that kind of conversation, and then the physician needs to figure out the best way to respond. And of course, it is about the patient. It's not about you know the physician's own uh, belief. But you know, I, I practice in a small town, and people know each other outside, and so we might know each other's uh, faith practices and be aware of that, and maybe even have conversations outside the office about it. And so I've certainly had patients who were aware that who were, they were aware that I was Baha'i who asked me about it because they were, I thought, sincerely curious about it, but it happened that they got to see me in the exam room instead of at Safeway. And um, so that that's not an uncommon situation. And, you know, so one has to be careful. I don't want to offend them. I don't want them to think that I um, am resentful of the question, but it also isn't an appropriate conversation to have in the exam room. And so my approach to that is to you know, honor the question, honor their request, but say, well, you know, maybe we can get together uh, for coffee or some other time and, and have a conversation about this. Um, or maybe there's someone else that you'd like to talk with. Um, so it's just a little bit different from, you know, the, the patient request for prayer in a room. But yeah, I, I, I did you do a good job? <laughs> <laughs> You're alive and talking, so. <laughs> Other comments or observations on this this question of participation in the patient request? <laughs> oh, sorry, there's a couple back there. I didn't, I didn't see you. Um, yeah, maybe start at the way far back. So recently, there's a physical, physical therapist whose uh, patient asked him or her to pray with them, and it turns out later the physical therapist billed the patient for the prayer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What's kind of your reaction to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know there was a code for that. <laughs> uh, it's America, right? Capitalism at its worst. Yeah, you know, I, I would say, you know, just um, uh, you talk about the dynamic, and I would say. One thing that I've appreciated so much, uh, my father did a lot of home visits. I know you've done home visits, you've done home visits. And going into a person's home, the power dynamic is different. I mean, you, you are there, you're kind of the guest, uh, you're kind of their guest, but I learned so much by going into people's homes, and I, I, think, I think medicine does miss that. I mean, I, I, there's been a, unfortunately, just the way medicine is, it apparently isn't, 
isn't able to, we're really not being able to be efficient enough to have allow physicians to do it, but I think you miss out on a lot. And uh, um, there's all kinds of practices that actually you, you, you learn about a patient by visiting them in their home. And that's, that's, those are actually the two times that I've been asked, asked to pray with uh, patients has been in their homes. Yes. I'm going to stand up because I can't hear. And you may have addressed this already. This is for the doctor in the yellow shirt who's the hospice guy. <laughs> I'd like to know if your practice of medicine or your feelings about medicine have changed as a result of working in hospice. Do you think that you had a different way of looking at medicine and humanity before you worked in hospice than you do now? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, there's lots of books written about medicine. And Dr. Group just talked about Atul Gawande's sort of take on things, and I, I would highly recommend that book as well. Even the organization I practice in, hospice is a little different way of doing it than, than, than regular medicine. I mean, it's really a nurse-run organization, and I I would totally advocate to keep it that way. Um, it's a different way of looking at, uh, you know, life and healing and all sorts of things. You know, we really focus on our goal at that point definitely is symptom management. That is exactly what we're focused on. And that really is, you know, important. It's really important to patient and it's really even more patient driven than anything in medicine. I mean, what the patient wants is what we do. You know, I talked about trying to make things special. I mean, some of the just incredible things. This, this community has an incredible amount of wonderful volunteers that it blows me away the things that they've done. We've taken people fishing with their oxygen tanks and done all sorts of things. We've, uh, um, it's kind of like sometimes we do some make-a-wish things for patients. And it's, an, it's, a, it's a thing in medicine I wouldn't have imagined that I would really be a part of. And like I said, just honored to be, be a part of that. So yeah, it's absolutely a different way of looking at uh, uh, medicine and a career, but I actually think, to me, we were talking about this, I am kind of hectic and I have two hats and life is kind of crazy busy for me, but I really think if I could do both, it, it really would help me, it helps, it helps me in both, both jobs. It helps me in my primary care role to look at patients and look at, look at where they're at on the trajectory. You know, are they heading towards the end of their life and should we really be focused on these procedures and having those conversations <coughs> a little bit earlier to not put people through so much stuff? I think that's a good thing for my primary care hat. But then again, my primary care hat helps, helps my hospice hat. It helps me when I go to hospice, there's a lot of primary care things. So just know, letting the nurses know how offices really work and the, the pressures that all doctors are, and offices are sort of under to you know, try to get all this paperwork done and do everything. And, I, and you know, and seeing the basic common problems that come up. But yeah, it helps me. I appreciate those newborn baby exams that I do in my primary care, and then I appreciate just the touching things at the end of life. So, and I, I think I would have a hard time doing one or the other, actually. I think both of it would burn me out. <laughs> so, I'm hoping I can find a balance, and I'm hoping I can get there. So, that's <laughs> someday I'll have balance, maybe. <laughs> do any of the other panelists want to sort of address that question of what, you, what you've learned from your practice? Now that you hadn't anticipated when you started, mm -hmm. you don't have to. Well, no, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the the practice of medicine. I mean, if I wanted to sum it up, it's a with the right attitude. It, I think it's just a very humbling experience because you just see the whole the whole spectrum of human experience and really. Um, appreciate, it calls you to appreciate the inherent nobility of every person because it's really the only way that you can do this job is to look at that person in whatever state <coughs> they may be and however they got there, that if you can see that nobility within them and address that, then it's so much easier to, to help them. and to help them heal and to help them make a difficult journey. And so, and it calls, the, the, the daily practice of medicine really calls on you to be very aware of that every single, with every single patient. Because there are many difficult patients um, 
very difficult. People whose name you see and you think, oh. <laughs> none of you. <laughs> but none of you. Um, and, and so it's, it's like this exercise every day to strive to see that person, that person's soul, really, if you want to put it in those terms. So it's a good spiritual daily practice, I guess. Let's move on to uh, an, another question um, that has to do with sort of the demographic of, of Oregon in terms of its spiritual and religious demographic, which is very distinctive. Um, as uh, Dr. Grube alluded to, much in medicine is very contextual. Oregon has a very different context for religion, religious expression. As, as many of you know, it's one of the, the least church states in the, in the United States. Um, uh, and uh, that raises for, for physicians and practitioners different kinds of challenges with respect to caring, from, to caring for persons from other kinds of cultures than, say, might be historically mainstream or dominant. So persons from Native American <coughs> traditions or Eastern uh, uh, tradition or New Age uh, spiritual movement. Um, uh, could, you ex could you speak just briefly to how you how you're able to care, or how you form that kind of relationship that you've both spoken about with a person from a culture that you're really not familiar with. Um, Dr. Clark, would you mind going first on this one? Mm. I, I want to tell a story because this, this probably helped inform me. Uh, the Laotians was one of the stories. I'll tell you another story. When I was doing my residency and I was in uh, Phoenix, uh, Arizona. I did take care of a, a Native American population, um, and we had a gentleman who came in. He was probably, I think he was probably 20, who had taken an overdose of theophylline, which, thank goodness, is not very commonly prescribed anymore. And he was taking it in a long-acting form, which meant that he came in. He took the overdose as, because his girlfriend broke up with him. The kind of the classic, you know, thing that happens. But he came in seizing, and he had been seizing for days. Uh, so he had a very severe condition, he was intubated, he was in the ICU, and we were trying to save his life. There was no family to talk to. Um, he developed a condition where both legs had swollen so severely from the periods of time he didn't have enough oxygen that he had to have fasciotomies, he had to have his legs cut open to release the pressure. And he got severe infections, and he had multiple physicians, all kinds of specialists taking care of him. And uh, eventually, a uh, recommendation was made for him to have bilateral amputations of both of his legs. He survived. Um, he was profoundly depressed um, after he survived. Um, and a social worker informed me that, you know, in his culture, uh, a man with no legs is not a man. There was no one to talk to to get cultural context at the time, and no understanding that it was necessary to get cultural context at the time um, of what that would mean and how a family member would never have said, yes, do this. You know, his, his decisions makers would not have said, yes, cut off his legs, because they would have known what it meant. And it would have been difficult for the people taking care of him to say, well, he's, he's young, we should cut off his legs, he should live. Um, and <coughs> so it's, these kind of things make it really difficult um, to know what the right thing is to do. And, and it's, it's always, to me, trying to understand what the person would want, what religious background, what cultural context uh, is it appropriate. And sometimes you can't find that out but you find, you, you call friends, you call family members, and you try and get that information. We have ways to um, uh, get translators uh, on the phone to help us. They're medical translators, they're specialists that help us talk to people, but that doesn't get at the heart of some, some cultures are so different that we don't really have a, a good context, and so getting family members uh, and people that care about um, the person if they can't speak for themselves uh, to uh, help make decisions um, has been, uh, and that's something we have to do in the hospital pretty often because you have somebody who might come in um, who's not able to speak for themselves. 
and um, it's it can be very difficult, but I think it's very important because you have to honor what the person would want, um, and it's hard sometimes to know what the person would want. And, and as the, the spirit touches you, and uh, uh, just that that particular book just describes as well, it's it's like sometimes we have just no concept whatsoever because we're a bunch of white people that grew up in the United States. Like, what does that mean? Uh, you know, not not all of us. I, mean, I am a white person who grew up here. And, so what does this mean? What do, what, do, what is right for this person? Um, isn't necessarily what I would pick for a family member. And so I have to really honor what's going on for that person. So does that answer the question? That's wonderful. Other panelists want to address the sort of cultural context <coughs> um, some patients present? I'd say uh, a couple times it's uh, come up when I was in uh, residency, we practiced. We had a Hmong population. That uh, the I think it's very. Uh, there's kind of a eldest male is sort of a uh, decision maker, and you know I'm in America. We're sort of trained to talk to the person, and uh, you know to have that person always defer to someone else is just a little off-putting. I mean, I think I've I got a little better understanding after a while about that. You know, when I moved. Here, uh, and even in our hospice world, sometimes with different cultures, our nurses really struggle, especially with uh, females deferring to their, to their husbands. It, it's a little bit, um, the, the line towards um, abuse or neglect or inadequate care is sometimes challenging for our nurses, and we've actually had to sort of figure out who can match up with who and who can kind of work through that family unit to try to figure out, and then, you know, is you know is a situation where a person's really not being allowed to make their decisions on their own, or are they deferring to to someone willingly? That's always kind of a tough tough thing to figure out sometimes. So, it's definitely been a challenge. Members of the audience that would we'll want to engage panels on cultural patients, do you actually ask them? up front, or do you wait for them to tell you, this is my practice? Well, the question was about a spiritual health assessment, um, <coughs> which uh, in, uh, in my opinion, in a, in a utopian world would be uh, fabulous, but uh, um, might also then make this, rather than a whatever minute appointment, a really minute appointment. <laughs> and uh, so mo most Practices, I believe, um, have a, mi a much less sophisticated way of set someone speaking what their faith is, they're Jewish or they're Catholic, which you know I tried to always look at in the corner of my eyes, so that then gives me a little perspective or context in this visit, um, and then depending, of course, upon the uh, presenting problem, you know, if it's a spiritual problem like depression. <laughs> Uh, or relation, <coughs> relational problem um, be much more likely than to investigate that. Um, but to use uh, to use a specific spiritual health tool, and I, I've seen some of them. I never I never did that myself. In, uh, in the hospital, I do not use a spiritual health assessment tool. Um, we do a social history um, and ask about you know the living situation and. Uh, diet histories and things like that and, and in the context of that the, the religion is asked about but um, I think the, the way we hope that we'll un uncover that is when we ask is there anything important that you want to share with us that you think is important for us to know in order to provide good care for you and that question is my most important go-to question and I hope that that will open up that conversation. You know, I would say with my two hats, my hospice hat, it's, again, we have a whole spiritual care person that that's what they do. And to be honest with you, I'm, I'm humbled by their training because they're way better at it than I am. I mean, I didn't really receive any training in it. I, I don't, and I always have to figure out is if I open up that, uh, you know, that question, I probably should be ready to try to help with something. Let's say they're in spiritual distress. Am I going to be a person to really help them or not? I mean, we can answer, I'm willing to talk about it if they bring it up. But I, you know, I, I think uh, 
time-wise in an office setting, in my primary care, you know, 15-minute visit, I'm not going to be able to really do that. Or, you know, you got to be careful. You ask a question, how long is that going to take? You kind of have to really gauge that. Whereas, you know, in the hospice world, uh, we have someone that can sit down for an hour or two hours, come once or twice a week even if, if needed, and then actually connect them with, with their spiritual community. They actually have connections with all their you know, all the different uh, religions uh, around the area, they actually, and then involving them in their own community really kind of helps connect the, helps connect them and heal the family uh, after too, so. My experience is, is really the same. I mean, the, use the help questionnaire to, where the patient can identify if they belong to a certain faith community and then um, if there's a certain situation where, um, that might be brought to bear, then I ask it. But I, I was having a conversation um, the other day with a, a friend of mine who's a, a mental health therapist, telling him about this meeting tonight. And so he, he sees people who maybe have just tried to commit suicide and you know now he's gonna try to help them move past that. And he said um, that he, one of the questions he asks in that interview is whether or not they believe in God. He's very upfront about it. Um, and then, depending on their answer, um, he'll, he'll use that question to help them understand more or, or explain more about what they see their, their purpose in life is. And he'll use that as a tool to um, help treat them. But he was, he was very unapologetic about what seemed like a blunt question, but he's a pretty blunt guy. <laughs> um, but it, I haven't use that approach. <laughs> we have about um, 10 minutes left, uh, and I'd like to just at this point open it up to any of you for any questions that have risen in your mind over the last hour or so. Um, so try to keep those on target, so if you've got a burning medical diagnosis you'd like to have, maybe wait for some other time to ask that question. But, um, any, any questions that you would like to ask of, of our panelists here? So it sounds like among the four of you, there's a common theme where you like to let the patient lead and um, give example of how they feel they need to be healed personally. How do you emotionally or morally cope personally if a patient just does not want to participate in that conversation? They're not giving you any clues and possibly even make they don't want to be healed. How does that affect you personally? Well, um, I'll start first on this, and I'll, I'll use the word, the C word, which uh, probably is, you, many of you might think is the opposite of spirituality, but I don't think of it that way. And that's called compartmentalization. And so uh, I have a full day, I have many patients to see. Um, I have to figure out at each time how to construct a path with each person I'm seeing to help them. And uh, if I then uh, am, am unable to um, have a good relationship or something with that patient, I have to be very careful not to take that on to the next uh, per person because that next person has their individual problem. So I find, have found that the healthiest doctors, uh, the best doctors, compartmentalize really well. And that sounds like it's a uh, uh, cold, um, uh, cruel thing, but I, I think it's very, very important. And as many of the things that we've talked about here this evening have need to be compartmentalized with each patient. So if it doesn't go well, we're not having a good conversation. They, uh, uh, I need to get through that in the best way that I can. But I, if I take it to heart and and I'm depressed with my next patient. That's unprofessional. So if someone doesn't want to address taking care of themselves, which is a common thing that we will run into people that um, don't own their own health, they want you to fix it, give me a pill, do, me, do something else, um, they're, they're not participating then I think a frank conversation with them about what you see and, and what your concerns are and then and, and letting them know that this is what your concerns are. That's how I deal with it is I just tell them this is what I see, 
and I'm concerned about you. Um, and this is why, and I would like to offer you um, another visit, or a specialist, or a uh, you know a medical mental health person, or here are the things because I'm worried that you're not taking uh, either I'm not being clear or you're you're not understanding what needs to happen to help you um, get better, um, and that's and and that way it is theirs. It's still you turn it back over to them. We we can't take that on. We have to. That's that's theirs. Um, I can't fix people. Yeah. I, I, I've spent many years trying to fix people. My husband will tell you. Um, <laughs> but, um, but we can't. And so people have to take ownership. And if they, if they can't, then maybe something's in their way. What can we do to help you? And if there's nothing we can do, we move on. I think that's part of the maturation process of the physician yes. is, is to understand that you're not there to control people. I mean, a lot of people when they start in this profession, they think, well, I'm just going to be able to tell the person to do this or to that, and they'll listen and they'll do it, and all will be good. But you soon realize that that's not how it works. Um, and so it means getting rid of our own sense of the need to control others and <laughs> to really understand um, how to create an environment where a patient has the tools that they need to take ownership of their own health. Um, which means asking a lot of questions, like, like you do, it sounds like you're very good at that. Asking the right kind of question so that the patient can take whatever next step they can take. And then not feeling bad about it if they don't make the decision that you want them to. I, I spent sleepless nights about that and I don't anymore. Yeah, it, it really, it's, it's kind of amazing when they do follow your advice. No! <laughs> <laughs> wow! So. I was just wondering if any of you, looking back on your training at university, would feel that possible changes could be made to make that, you know, steps could go forward to make physicians more culturally literate, um, because I get the sense that perhaps, and I don't want to speak for you, but do you feel like perhaps you weren't as prepared as you might have liked to be culturally or of other people's religions? going into primary care and dealing with people? I want to repeat the question. Yeah, the question is, looking back on your training, would there, is there things that you wish that you had had that made you more culturally prepared or prepared for these different spiritual uh, things? Well, um, being the oldest person on the panel by far, uh, yes, because I went to medical school right after the Civil War. <laughs> and, you know, it was all males in the medical school, and it was all uh, Caucasian males in the medical school. There were a couple of women. Um, uh, and we had no training. So I'd like to have had a lot more training than that. Uh, but I mentioned some of you had some training. So I'm probably the next oldest. <laughs> Um, and it was uh, after uh, maybe World War One that I <laughs> um, and I trained in inner city Detroit, so I had um, a different. Uh, Oregon was shocking to me. I had never been in the places. I kept trying to put my finger on why doesn't it seem right here? You know? After a while, I finally figured out it was just too darn white. It's just so white. Um, but. Um, I, when I went, it was 15% women. Um, that, that was a quota they had just said that year. Before that, they hadn't had very many women. And they, people asked me who I slept with to get into school, which was kind of a not very nice thing to do. Um, so that was culturally inappropriate. And there was a lot of culturally inappropriate stuff that happened at that time. But my son is a third year medical student at OHSU. And they get culturally sensitive um, training now. And um, I see that happening, it's also happening at Western. Um, and they are trying to make sure people get that. We had it at the Student Health Center, you know, we had called, because we had such a, I'm pointing at Dr. Hustand over here because we work together at OSU. Um, and, and that's very important to be um, aware. And so I, I think that they are trying to make that an active part. It's hard to be, hard to know what all that means with all the multiple different types of cultures that we are uh, running into. Um, and it's hard to know, like Dr. Foley said, when you have uh, a, a woman who comes in with a male um, husband or 
representative and whether they're deferring because that's culturally appropriate or whether they're being uh, menaced. And it's very, it's very difficult, but we do the best we can. But I think they are really working actively on making sure people are trained. Yeah, and I think it will help that medical system. Yeah, so I World, World War II. World War, yeah. World War II. <laughs> and then what happened? Vietnam War. Something like that. Uh, but you know, my med school class was half, uh, fifty from three percent women, so females. Uh, as far as cultural, I come from South Dakota, and I would say, um, you know, I think med schools really do have to look at uh, taking students from their own communities to kind of go back to their own communities. It's kind of a sad state on the University of South Dakota School of Medicine. I love my school, I have good training, but when I when I was there they'd still never been able to they never graduated a Native American from their med school. And uh, it's difficult. It, you know, South Dakota, let me talk about that state for just a little bit, uh, wonderful state. Uh, it's kind of a couple different South Dakotas though, and the Native American population, the uh, reservations are very they're some of the poorest places in the in the world. Um, and it's difficult. Doctors have, uh, I know there's one place there where a doctor, the uh, Indian Health Service, they would, there were 17 doctors in 16 years. It's, uh, it's really hard for people that are not in that community to go. And I think they have tried, but I think we need to make a bigger effort to actually, you know, ex expand our medical school diversity as well. And I think that, that would help. I mean, Students learn from each other quite a bit, and if what you're looking around for, you don't, uh, you know, we'll, we'll kind of see the same people. And I think it's trying. I, I do think that there's, I think it's a, it's a big effort, and it's a hard effort, and it's a society-wide effort. I don't, I don't have anything to add. Maybe one last question. Uh, if someone wants to uh, <coughs> take one. Um, okay, go ahead. Give someone else a chance if they have. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, when any of you guys have chosen a different career given what you know now about medicine? <laughs> if what? Advise your children to go into medicine. No. That I've tried. <laughs> they want to be mathematicians and physicists. So. Woo. <laughs> I don't. No, it was what, if you knowing what you know now, would you have chosen another path, another curriculum? Oh. No. Ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, would we, if I look back, would I, would I have gone with my children? You. you. Me. Oh, I absolutely would. Um, I uh, was absolutely blessed uh, in the almost 40 years of medicine that I, that I was in. And um, we, you do hear people complaining and whining about uh, too much paperwork and uh, too many insurance companies and the fractured healthcare system. But it's a first world problem. We talked about that before. I mean, doctors are blessed. Doctors make a lot of money. They have great facilities. Um, we have enough to eat. We drive a nice car. Absolutely um, are blessed with great patients. Every single day get positive reinforcement. So without a doubt for me, yes. Yeah, me too. Uh, I, I'm, I'm honored to be a physician. It's been a wonderful experience. It's only been 36 years, so I have at least four more to go if I have to follow this project, so um, it's great. I, I would do it again, but I, but I advise people that are going into it, you have to make sure it's your passion. I mean, I, I thought about in college doing lots of different things. I, I knew it firsthand. My father was a solo practitioner in a small town, and I actually told myself I wouldn't do that for a long time. Because I knew what it was about, and I saw my brother go through med school and my sister go through med school, and it's again, it's not just a career; it's something that I I knew you had to. You really become that person, and it actually becomes part of you. It's not. Uh, it, it is, you know, slightly different than than a regular job, and you know, there there are challenges. I mean, uh, uh, there's lots of challenges right now that you know really pull at a person. Um, so I guess I would, but because I don't know. I don't know what else I do, uh, so I guess I'd have to go and do it again. But, uh. <laughs> I echo all of that, but um, for those of you who are thinking about this path, I, I can't um, emphasize enough the importance of making sure you're working with great colleagues. And so, uh, Sean, though Sean and I were really blessed with working with Dr. Groove and Dr. Byram in the back for a lot of years, um, who both served as exceptional mentors to us. 
um, and really certainly helped me in my professional and personal development. Um, so really the, the setting makes a lot of difference as far as how much you can retain that passion for medicine and that interest in caring of patients. So thanks. Thank you. <laughs> well, I uh, appreciate our panelists this evening. Um, I appreciate uh, all of you attending. There's been many books written recently about the soul of medicine or the soul of a doctor. Um, I think this evening we were able to witness for the last hour and 20 minutes what that soul really is. And uh, I'm appreciative to all the panelists. Please join me in thanking them for it.